Namaste uh, and good evening, everyone. And uh, so we have now reached the last chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, 18th chapter, which uh, we are going to do it today and uh, half of it today and uh, the rest tomorrow. And tomorrow we will conclude. Uh, uh, the 18th chapter is called uh, Mantra Sanyasa Yoga which is about attaining liberation. Attaining liberation is all about the, uh, the liberation from the limitations imposed by our mind, intellect, and body on the self. So when we are encased, or when, when the self is encased by the BMI, and when the BMI with the self enlivening it masquerades as the jiva, and it takes uh, upon uh, the identity as I, and we all think that the jiva with the BMI and it's all these variations is what each one of us is, forgetting the fact that it is the self which is devoid of any of these qualities. And there is only one. And that one we forget and we think that we are the many. That is what Sanadana Dharma teaches us. And that is the principle of the Sanadana Dharma. And that is the only principle of the Sanadana Dharma to understand that oneness in the multitude. And that is the reason why we we, uh, we base all our uh, value systems on Vasudeva, Kudumbagam, etc. Uh, so that uh, is uh, the essence of the knowledge and therefore the wisdom of Bhagavad Gita, which talks about how that self, when it is expressing through your BMI and exiting our body constantly as uh, your thoughts, our thoughts and actions, how that thoughts and actions can be synchronized with the infinite value systems, the value systems of Brahman. Therefore, each individual can rise up to the status of Brahman, the infinite, the divine. divine. So that's basically what the Gita is in a nutshell telling us. All can, this can be achieved only through cultivating a mindset of sacrifice. That sacrifice is the actual reflection of the infinity. So when we actually start thinking in terms of helping as many others as possible by making necessary thoughts and actions and sacrificing the distractions that may stand in the way, at that time, our mind is now getting tuned to the infinite and that is the state of sacrifice. The mind, state of the mind that is tuned to sacrifice. And therefore, that sacrifice is the direct manifestation of infinitude within us. This is the fundamental thing that we need to understand. The moment we start thinking of Tyaga, <clears throat> thinking of sacrificing and helping, not only just us, but everyone else as much as we can, and that kind of a mindset, is a mindset of sacrifice and that is basically what the reflection of infinitude is. And then what happens is our thought which is tuned into infinitude will actually act in the way that is in tune with sacrifice, sacrificial mentality. So every act becomes a selfless sacrifice and that is divinity in action. So the, the moment we start thinking and acting in that way, we are actually rising to the level of divinity. So this actually is not to be taken just in terms of that phrase and then you know think, oh, I, how can it be possible? It is in every thought and action, in every engagement, every transaction in our life, we can bring this element of sacrifice and therefore uh, the divinity in, into action. And we have discussed so many examples in uh, direct application in work and life, etc. So every day, every minute can be an act of selfless sacrifice. So we are every moment living divinity. And divine actions are always auspicious and they are tuned towards goodness. So auspiciousness and goodness is what we radiate. Every human being can reach that state. It can be seen in the face, in the eyes, you know, the, the twinkle in the eye, the sparkle in the eye and the aura that we generate 
by that kind of thought and action, auspiciousness and goodness is radiated. And living a life like that is devotion. That is bhakti. And that bhakti is the true existence. The existence in bhakti is true existence. We are actually now sinking with the infinite existence. So we have reached the state of infinitude through the actions of bhakti, which, are, which is auspicious and it is reflecting and radiating goodness through the process of selfless sacrifice. That is what the process that we have seen. And how we actually start applying this wisdom in everyday life, in every situation in life, and seek the opportunity to apply this in the uh, the, the in, in, in the opportunities that we get in life to express this divinity is basically what Gita is attempting to do. Gita intelligence is attempting to do. That kind of a constant judgment made by the intellect to be in tune with the infinitude is the highest level of intelligence that we can express through the device that is provided for us, which is the brain. So the intellect actually in tune with the infinitude and emerging from that kind of an intellect is this mindset expressing as thoughts and actions in selflessness. That is divinity and that is the intelligence that Bhagavad Gita is telling us to exhibit. And for that, you know, it is not just simple word intelligence. It is about the hundreds of such elements of Gita intelligence that we have been seeing from chapter 1 onwards up to now chapter 18. We have reached the state of the final chapter where we actually should be by this point in time be able to reflect on this, uh, in, uh, this infinitude and thus break free from the shackles imposed on us by the body, mind and the intellect. Specifically the first shackle that is put on us is the ego, the intellect of the uh, intellect. Ego is one aspect of the intellect and that is the first shackle, the first chain that binds us. Ego. And then comes the uh, judgments and other things which are because of ego tying us to the BMI. So selfishness sets in from the intellect. And then the emotions are in tune or uh, is always going to take control of it because intellect is now powering the mind and the mind what happens is the emotions start rising and takes control of the intellect. And therefore, mind thinks that I am the mind. And then the mind then takes, uh, you know, translates things uh, to these powers to the senses and the senses take control and we run after the pleasures. So that process now we will see again um, summarized in this chapter. So this is the process by which we get derailed from uh, this path of divinity. And uh, now, for Gita, what it does is, Bhagavad Gita, intelligence is talking about, uh, from chapter 1 to 6, the Karma Yoga. Work carried out with supreme motivations. The supreme motivations are the joys of the self. And applying right attitudes and integrating your attitudes, fundamental attitudes, without any likes and dislikes. Through Karma Sanyasa, and in a state of law, through a meditative state of mind, leads us to dexterity of action. Dexterity of action is basically what the result of Karma Yoga is. PG 1, chapter 1 to 6, Karma Yoga. And then when that dexterity of action is combined with the confidence of your inner self, understanding the infinite, infinite self as the universal imperishable and ultimately in tune with the infinitude and with the conviction that all manifestations of our abilities, physical abilities, are but the reflection of that power through our mind, intellect and the senses. And you reach the state of inspiration and action. That is the way you actually reach that inspired state of existence in this world in devotion with the infinite self. That is chapter 7 to chapter 12, which is the bhakti part of Bhagavad Gita. And this inspiration, when it is rooted in our analytical and differentiating capabilities, that is the intellectual capabilities of subtle differentiation, viveka, 
you start identifying with the self as the infinite you become the self you you do not uh, you do not fall prey to becoming the bmi but instead you become the self you reach the state of liberation from limitations that is moksha and that is basically what chapter 13 to 18 talks about the jnana part of bhagavad gita the last six chapters and we have reached the 18th chapter now which summarizes the whole thing in the jnana path that is karma and bhakti is now going to be defined in terms of knowledge so knowledge everything is knowledge karma the way we acted and that is rooted in karma no sorry jnana similarly bhakti is rooted in jnana so the jnana that is inherent in karma and bhakti is now going to be elaborated in this one chapter so what this is practical gita intelligence so if you you know last 18 uh, uh, weeks we have been looking at the gita in all details it is about you know dexterity in action in the practical uh, plane of living in this world in this trans uh, transactional world of our experiences and our uh, relationship with the objects of the world and our interaction with these objects in our daily life uh, living dexterity in action is one motive that we should all be powered with then to be inspired in uh, that action it is not only about your skill but it is also about your bhakti the inspiration that you put in in your actions and thereby you getting liberated from the limitation symbolized by the bmi which means that you get every day becoming better and better at what you do and all this geared towards what sacrifice selflessness that is dext so these three dexterity in action is karma yoga inspiration in action is bhakti yoga and liberation from limitations is ultimately the jnana yoga it is about producing more than what you consume and enhancing what you produce and therefore the environment the world that we live in and expanding your reach your conscious awareness about the world and its problems and trying to you know trying to build up a world that is sustainable Produ producing enhancing and expanding in three words if you put bhagavad gita in practical application it is produce enhance and expand rest are details 700 verses are giving the details of how to produce how to enhance the world and how to expand and leave behind a leave behind a lasting legacy that is what the world is all about physical world manifested world is all about and what is required for that for producing and enhancing and expanding the way bhagavad gita teaches us is through the process of renunciation and sacrifice so renunciation and sacrifice is the fuel with which we produce and enhance and expand the world that should be our motto and that is practical wisdom of the gita intelligence so that is how the 18th chapter starts produce ex enhance and expand through renunciation and sacrifice this knowledge has been part imparted to arjuna do your work do it with devotion and always keep expanding improving that's it that's the message and arjuna then had this doubt which because he felt that everyone else who is going to read this and learn this wisdom from year for years to come will have these doubts so let me ask that doubt now and summarize it so he asked arjuna ask krishna what is the essence of renunciation and sacrifice and what is the difference that's what arjuna asks asks krishna in the first verse of this 18th shloka so he we are going to now have and he addressed krishna in a particular manner you know how it is he addressed krishna as oh mahabahu rishigesha and keshi nishudana three three uh, adjectives uh, were used by arjuna to uh, address krishna they are very symbolic now mahabahu mighty armed rishi kesha the lord of the senses 
control the the power that controls the senses and kesi ne shudana killer of demons so these are the three powers that are inherent in us and therefore the mind is now trying to derive that strength from that power which is the power of the self but mighty armed lord of the senses and killer of demons the self is all powerful it gives us the strength in every cell in our body the physical strengths and not only that it gives us the control power for the senses to control the senses the power of mind to control the senses sense control lord of the senses therefore it is the lord of the senses rishikesha and it also helps us to balance the mind and the intellect mind control by controlling the mind you are we should be able to kill the negativities within us and let the positive powers come through so killer of demons of the mind that is keshi nishudana that is the name given to krishna therefore so krishna is the self within us with the root for all the physical powers sense control and mind control therefore arjuna addressed krishna as my uh, mahabahu rishikesha and keshi nishudana such a self such a krishna please tell me what is the essence of renunciation and sacrifice and what is the difference between these two terms that is how he starts in fact because of this physical prowess and the sense control and the mind control that we can actually shape our mind and the senses with that process is called as sanyasa and the power that is used is the satyaga that is renunciation and sacrifice so let us diff, let us see what krishna says krishna says renunciation is equal to giving up selfish actions that is renunciation so you you will not even think of doing anything selfish you will some some simply give up doing selfish actions that is renunciation and what is sacrifice tyaga the renunciation is sanyasa sanyasa means giving up selfish actions and tyaga sacrifice means giving up of selfish attachment to the results of those actions that is okay you give up selfish actions and everything that you do is selfless now when you do selfless actions after doing selfless actions what will be the result and what will i get that thought should also not be there that is tyaga giving up selfish attachment to results of actions so that is subtle difference but i i am sure it makes a big difference definition is subtle but it makes a big difference and if you understand that then we can shape our thoughts and actions in this world in whatever we do in professions in daily life daily living everything everywhere giving up selfishness and also giving up the your attachment to the results of their actions that is you know you do selflessly you do great team work at the organization and then you do and then later on you go back and sit back and complain about to you know i have been doing all this that that and this i did not get that or i should be getting this if you do that then sanyasa is there but no tyaga in the sense that therefore the results will become dimmed but if you can add sacrifice or element also into it that is you don't worry about what the results what results come and if you are able to give up that attachment or your eye on the results and engage in renunciation throughout your activities then the power of renunciation and sacrifice combining together is going to produce the highest level of power that will yield much 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 more results than you even anticipated that is what basically you can experience when you actually start living this renunciation and sacrifice so the difference is important understand that and try to think reflect on it and then also to see how this can be uh, practiced through the strategies that we discussed you can actually apply this so renunciation is not giving up our action actions renunciation doesn't mean that giving doesn't mean giving up of actions sanyasa doesn't means giving up of actions and going away to the forest 
Sanyasa is all about acting in this world, but selflessly. Don't do not, uh, you know, act in any selfish manner. Give up selfishness. That is Sanyasa. And then also the Ion results. That is Tyaga. So then you will be a rounded personality. In fact, you can see that there are five types of actions that we can perform, which is uh, duties. Then uh, selfish actions is one. Prohibited actions is another. And compensatory actions is another one. Contemplative activities is the last, highest level. So, Niyata, Kamya, Nishiddha, Prayaschitta and Upasana are the five types of karma that we can get engaged in. Niyata karma are the duties that you are enjoined to do. Kamya karma are selfish work aimed at selfish goals. Nishiddha karma are bad actions, prohibited work. Prayaschitta karma are compensatory actions that we perform. And Upasana are mental, mental actions. Upasana means mental action, contemplative actions that increase our inner strength for our enhancement of the skills of thinking, skills of uh, rounding up your uh, emotions and the powers of your physical body. Upasana, anything that you do to enhance these capabilities, the inner meditative activity is Upasana. And we engage employing these uh, capabilities in renunciation and sacrifice in various aspects of life, doing service, doing charity and austerities. For what? You know, basically, we need, you know, if you look at the Adi Deviga aspects, unseen powers that guide us, our life, and governs it. We do not have any direct control of it. For example, seasons, rains, and, you know, all those calamities and all earthquakes and other things that happen are from the Adi Deviga, natural disasters, etc. So we need to, we need to actually be blessed by the powers, Adhideviga powers, that we are not affected by this. That is one aspect of our life. The second is the Adhibhautika aspects, social and environmental conditions that we get, you know, we inherit and we also build up situations, things that govern our lives, family, our job, our friends, and our mode of conveyance, all those things form part of the Adhibhautika. Adhyatmika is related to the BMI equipment. We we can train or learn to experience control over the inner things, the mind's trans, uh, you know, fluctuations and changes, and also the health, the physical health, or also adhyatmika. So, with these aspects totally blessing us, our attitudes and our sense of gratitude, etc., with that we function in this world. In yajna, worship, dana, charity, and taba, austerity. Yajna or worship is required to invoke the divine blessings, the infinity and grace, as well as to express our gratitude. Devarana. Okay. So, dhanas are aimed at social harmony and indebtedness to fellow beings. So, we, we have seen this yajna, uh, different types of yajnas that we can perform. Uh, we, are, we have talked about uh, the Deva Yajna, Nri Yajna, Buddha Yajna, Brahma Yajna and all those things previously. Pitri Yajna, Nri Yajna, Buddha Yajna, Deva Yajna and Brahma Yajna. So five, five Yajnas which we perform uh, integrating these, uh, five, these three aspects of our life and employing all the Karma Yoga strategies, attitudes, etc. is basically what we should be rounding up our character, personality with. <laughs> then Krishna goes on to describe the three types of thyaga, sacrifices that you can perform. The tamasika sacrifice, rajasika sacrifice, and sat sattvika sacrifices are mentioned uh, in 7, 8, and ninth verses. It says, Giving up of one's duty is not proper in seventh verse of the 18th chapter. The abandonment of obligatory work or duties due to delusion, due to delusion, wrong thinking, is declared as tamasika. 
താമസിക ത്യാഗം യു ഗിവ് അവർ വർക്ക് ബിക്കോസ് ഓഫ് റോങ് തിങ്സ് ദാറ്റ് ഈസ് താമസിക ത്യാഗം ദെൻ വൺ ഹു അബാൻഡൻസ് ഡ്യൂട്ടി മിയർലി ബിക്കോസ് ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് ഡിഫിക്കൾട്ട് ഓർ എൻഗേജസ് ഇൻ ആക്ടിവിറ്റീസ് ഫോർ ദ ബെനിഫിറ്റ് ഓഫ് പെർഫോമിംഗ് benefit that you accrue from that is rajasika tyaga abandonment of duty due to difficulty or engagement in seeking results that is abandonment abandonment of selflessness actually that is basically what is happening that is all that is rajasika tyaga and the obligatory work performed as duty renouncing all the results and attachments So renunciation and sacrifice combining together is alone regarded as Satvika, Arjuna. That is what Krishna says. Oh Arjuna, please remember that abandonment of selfishness. Not even looking at the results and doing the work is basically what Satvika, Satvika Thyaga is. So it is defined, it is summarized. We have been talking of this in all the 17 chapters in various manner. And here it is summarized in three verses. so you know running tamasika uh, tyaga if you look at it running away from duties because of laziness renouncing work because there is no one to control and check on accountability etc abandoning one's culture and value systems for the glamour of other systems giving up disciplines of bmi because there is no compulsion that is all tamasika tyaga then rajasika tyaga medical condition forcing someone to quit smoking or drinking is rajasika tyaga and like you give it uh, smoking because uh, you know you uh, your health has deteriorated and therefore you are forced to do it that is not satvik tyaga but it is rajasika tyaga renouncing party ticket for con- contesting an election because of the fear of losing not wanting to marry lest it affect the physical appearance changing a religion to gain monetary benefits all these are rajasika tyagas satyaga tyaga is a soldier for example giving up life on the battle front to protect the nation is satyaga tyaga the highest form of satyaga tyaga in all earth one of that is this and giving up a meal for feeding the hungry and the destitute sacrificing your help another needy student or you know needy uh, mentee etc who is bad in the studies or in in, in his work or is a rookie and you are helping him that is sacrificing your time that is satyaga tyaga and seeking the joys of the self leaving behind selfish impulses selfish impulses pleasures etc you are giving up for the joys of the self that is satyaga tyaga in in its highest form so a man of satvik such satvik renunciation is able to recognize the presence of disagreeable emotions within and such people are able to actually see the mind in its working and he does not allow that mind to get involved when one is engaged in action the result of action is situated in the future it is not desirable to worry about that result but to focus fully in the present this is the secret for optimal gains which we have already seen in chapter 3 verse number 30 so uh, now do not uh, regret about the past do not be unduly anxious about your future and do not be agitated in the present but focus now and keep working then uh, we uh, you know abandoning the complete fruits of all actions is possible only for such people who have realized the knowledge of the self and he understands that action and its accessories and the results are all ascribed to the self by ignorance it is not the self self is in enlivening us but it is the mind and mind's fluctuations that actually produces the quality of our action and the results that thereof which can be you know it can give desirable results sometimes it could give undesirable results or it could be a mixed result it is not the self responsibility it is not because of the self but it is because of the mind's colors variations that the desirability and undesirability or the mixedness of the results happen so the one who understands the self realizes this 
So let us try out our understanding. A person resigns from his job out of fear of failure. What kind of tyaga is it? That is Rajasika renunciation. Abandoning one's culture for the glamour of another. Tamasika renunciation. A home for indwelling jiva. That is the gross body. Gross body is the home for the jiva. Now, a, an efficient and successful CEO, let's say, decides to take a superannuation instead of an extension offered to allow younger blood to fulfill aspirations. Sattvika renunciation. That is part of that is Sattvika renunciation. Or if you win a prestigious contract beating other competition, but had to reduce your fees and work on wafer thin margins, but that is actually a Mishra Bala. It has got both Rajasika and the Tamasika intentions. Not. It is therefore it will give you mis mixed re uh, re reactions only. Okay, so just uh, just give you a sample of you know how you actually should start thinking about these things in our real life. Now, from uh, then onwards, from 13th onwards, onwards, especially the first two, 13th and 14th, and uh, the rest of uh, a few more verses are going to describe karma in various perspectives. Karma. Now we know what action is, and we are going to look at it from different perspectives. 13 and 14th, 13th and 14th verses are now going to describe technically what karma is. There are five factors. It says there are five factors in the accomplishment of an action. Any action you do, there are five factors in play. What are they? Okay, it describes as the seed or the adhishtanam, actor, the kartha, then organs, karan, karanam, eh, sorry, karan, it is karanam, it is not karana, it is karanam, and uh, bio-impulses, cheshta, and divinity, deva. Five, five things that make up the accomplishment of an action, five factors. And now, you know, the time being, think about this, you know, as the knowledge that we need to assimilate so that we are able to identify with the self. That is why these details are given. So we have the Adhishtanam, Karta, Karanam, Cheshta, and Deva. Five factors that make our action. Now, let us look at a simple example. Let us look at the action of seeing with our eye. So, for that, what is required for I? For seeing something, you need to look at something and then see. For that, what is required physically, the body is required. The body means in the body, there is a part called as the I. So the I, the physical I, with which we actually look at things to, for seeing, is the organ. It is the part of the body, which is the basis, the Adhishtanam. Okay. Now, is only the Adhishtanam required? I? No. With just the physical apparatus, we cannot. We cannot see. It is only the first device that light enters. Then what happens? There is also the next, which is the karanam. Karanam. Karanam is the instrument. That what is the real instrument that makes us see? That makes us that is our optical center in the brain. Inside, that is the jnanindriya. Organs of vision, organ of vision, the perception center. So that is part of the mind actually. So mind intellect is also, you know, it's all referred there as karanam. The karanam, the vision center in the brain, include, which includes the mind also. That is without the mind getting in, uh, you know, in, in uh, combining with the eye, it makes us actually see the thing. In the brain, we get the experience of seeing because of that. If that karana is not there, only the eye is there, you will not see. You will still be blind. But when they combine, you will see light. And you can actually interpret that as a light. You know, whatever is coming in, in with meaning, only if you are a living entity. So that karta, karta is the jiva, the blind. intellect, everything energized by the self and in sitting inside and trying to actually enjoy it. So I am the doer, I am the enjoyer. 
ఇన్సైడ్ the light going into the brain and the brain and then you know processing that through kind of uh, you know chemical electrochemical impulses etc is happening inside so there is this power that is running through our complete body which are called as the bio impulses or the physiological functions and that power is called as the chesta you have, you need that a healthy system that is able to actually connect all these things together that is chesta and without the bio impulses the physiological functions whatever the eye collects whatever the optic center integrates and as the jiva starts enjoying it or and think is not possible without the chesta bio impulses okay now let's say all these four are there but it is pitch dark no light what happens you will not be able to see anything so that is provided by what that is provided by the elementary forces the forces of nature the reflection of brahman as ishvara everywhere universal forces that is so in this case it is working through light through the sun sun is providing that light so there is this divine power of light without divine power of light you are absolute zero nothing can be seen that is why everything that we do whether it is you know the eye as an example anything you take everything is divine experience without divinity nothing happens so imagine imagine this you know in all the senses through every sense this is happening this five factors are in play to make you actually act in this world so that is the reason why krishna says there are five factors and these five factors are adhisthanam karta karanam chesta and devam think about this and that if you understand what is happening is if you understand that really we will now try to analyze the agency of the self and see that it is an illusion okay such being the case for our all actions he who is untrained in the knowledge of the self looks at self as the agent if you do not know this we think that this functions as the jiva and sitting inside i the jiva is the self that is not self is that power sitting as the divine universal power that is enlivening all of us not only giving the light but also the life so it gives first the light as the universe that self infinite self is now the universal self ishara as appearing as light and then also the other elementary forces which helps us uh, within as the metabolic powers digestive powers etc giving us the energy so generating the energy within us through our chesta the physiological functions and then energizing the mind so that the mind then works through the eye and the optical pulses going through it connecting it all together so you have this integrated process or the action of seeing because of the divinity that is it. now now look at it, the kind of action that we do after seeing we understand something and we let's say start reacting based on that it is not the light that is the or the phenomenal powers that is actually making us do that isn't it now just in the manifested physical parlance or really think about it is the light okay we need light to see and then of course the other energy is also happening as i have explained and then we actually see something and then start reacting to it in a way five different people do it five different ways so if it is the one light that is actually making five different people 
in different uh, uh, ways that is you know that is not possible why is it bec becoming different it is becoming different only because the mind in intellect senses etc are different in the five different physical encasements and that because of that there is a difference actual the power that is within us making us function which is which we call as the self is the same so therefore self is not responsible for what you actually think and do but it enables it that's all it does it is not responsible for it it only enables it realization of this non agency of the self that is basically what is required and that helps us to absolve ourselves from the effects of all the work in the sense that we need not get dejected because we fail we need not get unduly happy or elated because we succeed it should not it is all the mind the mind when it is not working properly creates problem so we can help change that to become better in life this is now being emphasized in the next verse one who is free if you can actually think about this and understand that i the self is not the doer or the enjoyer doership and whose intellect is not polluted by the desire to own the fruits of the actions krishna says he neither slays nor is bound by the act of killing so whatever you do is not you know binding you so this is basically what in fourth chapter we saw as actionless in action in action in action so you when you are actions are completely in tune with the infinite sacrifice and renunciation then whatever you do will not bind you is basically because your actions are all selfless and selflessness is already there in this whole universe so whatever you you do is not going to affect or change the environment it is you are existing in that infinitude you are in tune with that infinitude and therefore your actions are non actions that is the technical you know explanation of the karma yogas in action in action and this is basically what you need to understand when I, in, in simple terms you know we can actually think of uh, you know uh, like for example you know you are going in a train bogey you are boy, uh, going at 80 kilometers per hour the train and on the next immediate track there is another train that is going uh, in the same direction let's say what happens if if that other train is going at 60 kilometers per hour and you are going at 80 kilometers per hour what will be the feeling that you will get you will get to see that the other train is in a slowly moving backward if you are going at 80 and the other train is going at 800 kilometers per hour you will see that the train is slowly moving forward but let us say that the other train is also going at 80 kilometers per hour then what happens you will feel the stillness of no action but you are still running at 80 kilometers per hour so that kind of an effect is basically what in action in action is all about it is when your mind is racing with selfishness you are actually either you know going degrading yourself or you know going astray and not in tune with infinity but the moment you actually cut away all your selfishness and you are actions are fully rooted in renunciation and sacrifice that is selflessness then you are action becomes in tune with the infinite you are in sync with the infinite there is no movement even though you are moving there is no action even though you are acting that is actionless in action okay conceptual understanding is important and then you can actually start applying that in our life and then we will see the differences which we have seen in the fourth chapter fifth chapter etc fourth defined actionlessness in action and this is actually the end of all actions that is what is kridanda it is called as kridanda this state of action in this world in selflessness which amounts to inaction in action is called as kridanda the end of action and this kridanda is the ultimate aim of vedanta okay so 
what, what do you understand? What, what is the philosophy of Vedanta telling you? The philosophy of Vedanta is teaching us the process of Kridanda. Getting to that state where your actions become inactive. Actionlessness becomes action. Okay, now, then Krishna defines another perspective of karma. 18th verse. The knowledge, the object known, and the knower are threefold driving forces to an action. What are the impetus or the triggers that make us act in this world? Three, three things, three factors are there. The knowledge, the object of known and the knower, three things, are required as the impetus for action. I will explain that. Then, in the same words, again, three more factors are defined. Another perspective is defined. The organs, the action, and the agents or mode of modes of nature, gunas, are the three components of the action. Okay, organs, action, and agent. So let us look at this uh, now. The knowledge, jnanam. The knowledge by which something is known of the object of the pleasure. This knowledge raises interest in your mind to acquire an object and gain it. For example, if you want to act, let's look at an example. Um, okay, ice cream. If you see ice cream and you have never seen ice cream before, you will never be actually interested in acquiring it. So no action, normally. But if you know what ice cream is from your previous experiences, then the sight of knowledge, uh, sorry, the sight of ice cream is actually going to trigger the knowledge about ice creams. And that is the first point at which you start thinking that I need to get it. Jnanam. So jnanam is required. Then nyayam, the object of pressure. You have experienced the object of pressure, ice cream. You have, you have once connected with it, so you know what that object is. The presence and that it has now come to your presence. You know about ice cream and it is now available. You can see it. So that object is also important for you to act. If there is no ice cream in sight, you will not think of buying that ice cream. Then, then there is the, of course, this can happen only in the jiva. That is, if I am a living and dieting. If I am dead to the world, nothing happens. If I am alive and kicking, then I know. So there is the Parijnata, the one who actually knows about this. Me, the self sitting in the BMI, the Jiva. Jiva knows about it. Jiva thinks about it. Jiva likes it. And therefore Jiva wants it. The memories or impressions that bind the self as the knower. Self is bound by your memories. Now, and then you start feeling that I need to experience it. Who partakes of the limits? Uh, this Ajitnyata is also required to be united with the object and the knowledge about that object. So that is why Krishna says that three are the impetus for an action. The, the power that makes us to act. Uh, three things are required. Jnanam, Nyayam and Ajitnyata. So there is, you know, there is an organ of the eye the action of actually enjoying it and the agent, which is the jiva, is required. So that is actually next. Three things here explained here. In the threefold impetus, the threefold impetus for any action, karma chodana. Knowledge, object, and the knower. How that is, the, those three come into play in enjoying an ice cream, for example, is shown here. I'm going to post these things so you for you to read and reflect. Then, another perspective of karma is given in uh, the next. That is the three consolidators of action. Karma, Sangraha. Three things are required. Krishna says, the three things that keep the action together as actions are they as the, you know, which drive our action is the organ, the end, and the agent. What is the organ, of course, that by which something is done? The external organ being the organ of hearing, sight, and also the karmendriyas. Any of those. That organ is required for impact. The end, that which is sought for. What is the purpose, the goal for which 
uh, you will get through this action. What is that? That is the end. And the agent is, of course, the GY again, who sets the organs going, partaking of the nature of the, the medium of the mind and the senses and the body, etc., conditioned by the gunas, Sattarajastava gunas. That is the agent. All this, that is the jiva. Jiva is the agent. So, in one shot, this diagram is also an infographic which I will be posting. Self in actionless action. It is actually showing the three uh, causes of karma. Karma karanam. Then, uh, karma karanam. Then the karma chodana, three things, knowledge, object, and the knower, and the karma consolidated sangraha, karanam, karma, and karta. So these are, this is how we act in this world. So what is karma? Karma is about the combinations of these things, looking at from three different perspectives. Now, that the self has no agencies, I will describe that. But before that, let us do, let us do some practical thinking. So, the practical thinking I will uh, give with some examples. It is about you starting to think that I am just an instrument in the hands of the self. So, it is about contemplate, think. When you start getting angry, let's say, you know, you, you can all equate to your daily situations in life. When you start getting angry, let's say, every one of us get angry. So, think about those kind of situations. At that time, what you should do is witness the anger as a stored impression within us that gathers momentum inside us. You know, you should look at that gathering momentum within us. Look at it from, you know, go inside and deeply look at this transaction happening in the mind. Something that is happening within the mind, but not as I am angry. Never think that I am angry. Self is never going to be angry. You should look at that anger as the mind's transaction. This will help subside the anger or the rage that could build up destroying your peace. Similarly, in another case, let's say you are frustrated. When you are frustrated about not getting something right, when you are trying to do something, you are, you know, failing. Witness the frustration as a reaction of the impressions and memories and the knowledge within us. But not as I am frustrated. Never look at it as I am frustrated. This will put pressure, uh, the, the, the reasons for the frustration in its true perspective. So you will understand why this is my impression. These are my memories, which means that knowledge that I have, the limited knowledge that I have at this moment of time, and with that I am doing some things. So my frustration turns into something that is trying to find out the reasons for the failure instead of, you know, getting completely, uh, what do you call, uh, you know, hallucinated with the thought that I am frustrated. Next, when you start getting elated, happiness, for example, unduly happy on achieving success, witness the elation as a response to the impressions and memories again, but not as I am delighted. This will prevent you from being overly joyful or arrogant with success. This is actually a process of self-introspection and trying to control your emotions from, you know, going out. Contemplate there or similarly. When you start feeling that the task you are not doing is not shaping up the way it should have been, Witness the result as a product of your mental and physical output based on what knowledge and impressions you have stored in the mind and the skill levels at which you are working. But not as I am failing. Never think that I am failing. You, will, you can never fail. Because everything is there in that power, the self. It is only that the mind at the moment is not equipped. So if you understand that, you will start doing something, tapping that self itself to change, make changes in the mind. Make, acquire new skills, enhance your skills, etc. That is why Krishna said, Ananya, you have to have this, you know, focused 
uh, you know, pursuit of excellence. Ananyas chindayan domam, ye janaha pedupasade, tesham, nithyabi yuktanam, yoga, shemam bahamiaham. I will, the self will help you to gather new knowledge or skills or to enhance your existing skills and knowledge. Yoga and shemam, I will take care of that. How? Ananyas chindayan domam, ye janaha pedupasade. So that is the process. I, I can never fail because I am infinite. When your well-wisher constructively criticizes you, be a witness to the criticism as being directed towards the qualities of my BMI and not me. I don't feel that I am no good and, or I am being reprimanded. This will help you not to respond to well-meaning criticism in anger or frustration, but will help you to take necessary steps to improve your knowledge and skill sets. Now, when someone criticizes you in a negative manner, let's say, not in a constructive manner, but in a negative manner, somebody is always trying to fool you, okay, or make you look less. And it is directed at you without uh, the other person knowing anything about the issue or about you, or just for sake of criticizing. Witness the incident as if you are a third party and not respond impulsively in anger or irritation. This will help you not only in not getting agitated, but also in deflating the intentions of the other person. You will also be able to see the impressions in the another BMI. The other BMI is getting angry because of the fluctuations in his BMI. And not it is not his self that is attacking yourself. It is your, his BMI attacking your BMI. So you should look at it in that way. Whereas the two individual selves remain neutral and unaffected because it is one. There is only one self. It is the same self expressing through my body as frustration or anger. Or, and it is the same self expressing to another body as reprimands and, and a ridicule. This will also help you expand your vision. Think, think in these terms. So, Because self is not the agent. The agents of action are different. Consolidators, you know, the, the factors, consolidators and, and, and the impetus for the actions are different. We have seen that, the elements that make these things different. If you really understand this, you will start seeing this now as kind of, you know, kind of puppet show that is happening around you. So self in action, less action. Really understand this through these practical processes. You have to practice, keep practicing this. Keep practicing what? Self has no agency. That is the causes. If the causes of an action are Adhishtanam, Karta, Karanam, Cheshta and Devam. You understand that the self is, has no agency. What you think and do is characterized by the nature of your impressions. Combined with ego in the jiva and conditioned by the capabilities of your bio body, by the bio-impulses, physiologies physical capabilities of the body, physical senses and the organs. Tapping the deva, the powers of the deva, you are acting. So, what is required to uh, for you to actually, you know, excel in this world or to connect with the knowledge that self has no agency. Curtail your ego. Be as selfless as possible. Develop a healthy body. Take care of your organs. Take healthy food. Keep a good environment. These are the things that we can do. Now, let us look at the other. Uh, chodana, the impetus for action. Jnanam, Nyayam, Paritada are required. So, if you are acting ignorantly about a particular, uh, something that you have in your hand, then what is, uh, you know, it is not because you are ignorant. Your mind is ignorant. Gain the right knowledge, experiences, associate with the right objects which are required and develop right motivations and higher goals. That is basically what you should do. That becomes, that should be the karma chodana that should drive you then. So you will actually shape the chodanas. 
you will shape the uh, adhishthanam you will shape the chodana and the next you will actually shape the consolidation of your action through take care of your actions organs action organs karmendriyas you will take care of it you will set higher goals and selfishness and develop a sattvic tendencies so this this is what we should do in practical world so that you become better and better at what you do so in our normal existence forgetful of the non agency of the self we think that i i i i am doing self is doing you know that's what we, that's what normally our existence is our, uh, you know in this world the ego takes full control making me and mine the most important things in this world giving us the experience that we often find ourselves in that is basically what is happening some of the experiences of the egoistic i can be listed as follows practical again practical implications of becoming egoistic but you tend to get impatient and restless when things are going slow or bad you start anticipation and apprehension of difficulties anxiety and lack of confidence you have a tendency to go into comfort zones limiting yourself because you have fear of failure you have either superiority uh, complex or inferiority complex depending on the situation you have, you you are run with pride, uh, pride and prejudices likes and dislikes haunting all your thoughts you're filled with jealousy and envy you become arrogant or conceited you, you your existence is between hope and despair sometimes you are very hopeful sometimes you are just hit by despair and all this you know you do not bring out the optimum capabilities because of ego this is all because of ego remove ego understand the self as the power that is within you which is capable of making you helping you to do anything in this world so how to do that applying thought processes to identify differentiate and generalize first of all to identify differentiate and generalize you know patterns of knowledge within of what you learn what you see what you experience from generalization to abstraction from then abstraction to application that is how our intellect works applying your thought process and then observation and analysis is at the power of the mind assigning meaning semantics correlating time space and objects stabilizing sensing and perceiving perceiving integrating the connections and understanding that is another set of activities that the brain is actually doing so that we make sense of this world and uh, through the process of generalization and abstracting from the particular to the general we learn specific things and then we start applying generally from moving to the unmoving you know, the fluctuating things you start making meaning out of it from changing to the unchanging so from basically our human brain is tuned for making meaning out of chaos variance to invariance from variance to invariance is basically what we are capable of doing the self is helping us through the mind and the intellect to do all these things so how does that do okay we have seen that also in the part of the brain the current in neuroscience is actually helping us to understand this process uh, in uh, neocortical layers and things like that how uh, for example in seeing how uh, a picture that comes to our eyes the different parts of a face let's say the the the, the recognition of a face you recognize various elements features of the eye and then you integrate that into a face and ultimately identify meaning give meaning semantic object uh, identification object identification is done this is how things are happening and for this there are def different layers in the neocortex in fact uh, it has been found that there are six layers and these six layers of information are basically integrating information so that it makes a, a meaning out of the uh, outer fluctuation so so what you see the picture that you see from of the outside world is coming in 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 uh, 
every saccade of the eye, the closing and opening of the eye, shutter and the iris. In fact, it is said there are three such pictures taken every second, and that is how we actually see things. You know, imagine thousands of pictures impinging our mind through the eye for uh, you know seeing something, and it is a changing world that is outside. People will keep moving, light keeps uh, fading and coming or whatever, you know. So it is not a constant picture that the brain sees, but the brain makes sense out of that through this kind of an integration is basically what happens. And therefore we are to we are able to see a, a world that is very stable. So imagine if that kind of identification of features, identification of objects, assignment of meaning and applying time space invariance we are able to bring a sense into this picture that we see in the outside world. And the highest level of integration is right on top. It is all because of the power of the self, which is the same one power that is actually giving us all this. And that is the vision that we need to develop. That is the ultimate vision. It is not, you know, we see the stable world, but we need actually want to see the stable self everywhere, infinite self. That is the ultimate spiritual evolution. What we have seen is material evolution, which is happening in the physical plane. And the spiritual evolution is about seeing the self as the one entity, the whole universe is, that is the vision. The holistic vision, that is sattvic vision, characterization of knowledge, sattvic knowledge. Sattvic knowledge is about this. Me giving meaning is giving, applying knowledge. And that is what in the physical world we are seeing here through our apparatus, sorry. Physical apparatus is given to us, which evolves, which has evolved into giving us a stable picture of the outside world. And if we are able to see this kind of unity in diversity, that is the highest level of knowledge that we can acquire. That is the spiritual evolution that we are talking about. The sattvic knowledge is about the unity in diversity. It's about the self that is within us. It is about this unifying and the infinite sustainable power that we all have. But if we see different things in different world, in, in different people as different, and then all these fluctuations as emotions and anger, etc., that is Rajasik, partial vision. And then negatively looking at things is wrong vision. So that is described, 20, 21 and 22 verses, the characterization of knowledge as sattvic knowledge, rajasic knowledge and tamasic knowledge. Knowledge by which one sees the one immutable reality, the self in all beings as undivided. Such knowledge is sattvic. The knowledge by which one sees different realities of various types among all beings as separate from one another, such knowledge is rajasic. And the irrational, baseless and worthless knowledge by which one clings to one single effect, such as the body or an external idol or symbol, as if it is everything, such knowledge is tamasic. And the attitude of the doer is also actually pacified as three in verse 23, 24 and 25. Obligatory duties performed without likes and dislikes and without selfish motives and attachment to the fruits of those actions is sattvic attitude. Action performed with the ego, with selfishness and with too much trouble, anxieties is rajasic. Action that is undertaken because of delusion, disregarding consequences, loss of injury to others, loss or injury to others, that is of the mode of ignorance, tamasic. Now, intellect is also class classified based on that. Characterization of the agent, the intellect, the agent. Now the agents are agents are described. Self is not the agent, but what is the agent? Intellect is the agent. The agent who is free from attachment, non-egoistic, endowed with resolution and enthusiasm, and unperturbed in success or failure, is called sattvic, constructive intellect. It is called as constructive intellect. Equanimous, equipoised, humble, powered by fortitude, positive and goal-oriented. That is what constructive intellect is all about. 
So that such an intellect, when the self enlivens, what happens? It will start reflecting the qualities of infinitude. But the agent, the intellect, who is passionate, who desires the fruit of work, who is greedy, violent, impure, and affected by joys and sorrow is called Rajasik. That is an aggressive intellect. Passionate, result-oriented, and emotional. The self is the self. Nothing, no characteristics. That self, when it empowers an aggressive intellect, the results are going to be Rajasik. And an agent who is indisciplined, vulgar, stubborn, Wicked, malicious, lazy, depressed, and procrastinating. Uh, procrastinating, it is co called as a tamasic agent. So, what happens is that intellect is passive, destructive intellect. Indiscipline, slothfulness, and negativity. That will be radiated. Self is not responsible. So, Characterization of agent is described in 26, 27, and the 28 versus numbers. So, so this is how it happens. The self, we have the self, which is within us as the life energy, then provoking the systems of metabolism, etc., digestion, etc., memory, etc. We have seen that in 15th chapter of also. Giving us the individual consciousness. Individually, you know, we may, uh, the self makes us individually con conscious because it is tying to tying us to the body, mind, and the intellect. And therefore, the ego is kindled and memories are kindled, and we take ownership, individuality, inclinations, habits, and experiences get formed. And therefore, that life energy, the self, becomes first the life in the ego and memories. Ego and memories become the representation of life, and then comes the mind as the equipment. Life becomes mind. So life, infinite self has now become, first becomes ego and memories and then becomes the mind. And then it becomes the life in the senses and the organs. Sensations, actions. So you see how the transformation of energy, the self getting changed to ego, mind, senses. Life getting changed to ego, mind and senses. And the mind, you know, desires and uh, greed, jealousy, anger, and all those things, you know, the variation. So, uh, in summary, we can, this is how the transformation takes place. The self, because of the sattvic, rajasic, and tamasic tendencies of the BMI, the jiva is the self combined with the sattvic, rajasic, tamasic tendencies of the BMI. That is the jiva. In, in a very simple terms, I am, I am showing that infographic on the right side. On the right side, if you watch, you will see what Jiva is. Sattvic, Rajasic and Tamasic. That is the Jiva. That Jiva now translates into knowledge within our mind. The, 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 the self, through the Jiva's mind, becomes the knowledge in the intellect, mind and the body driving the intellect, mind, and the body. And then as actions, so either sattvic, rajasic, or tamasic in, in, in a spectrum. Sorry. So this is how this is happening. So Krishna says that the action, we have this karta, karanam, and the karma. The jiva, the knowledge, then it becomes knowledge, and then the knowledge drives your action. All controlled by Sattva, Rajas, and Tamogunas as actions in this world. This is how the self is working within us through the agents of action. Self is not the agent. The Jiva knowledge and the Karma. Characterization of the agent. This is how the agent is characterized in detail. We can actually start, we should be able to now start seeing this happen within us. Knowledge and action are threefold because of nature. This becomes different kind of knowledge, different kind of intellectual actions because of Sattva, Rajas and Tamogunas. So, in 29, 30, 30, 31 and 32, 
Krishna again goes and describes the characterization of intellect in little bit more detail. So I have listed it out as a table here, which I will be posting. So basically, it is about Sattvika intellect is clear about what should be done and what should not be done, is clear in thinking and correctness of approach and promptness in action is the result. Sattvika. The intellect can discriminate between the right and the wrong. It is aware of duties and responsibilities and understands the role perfectly. He is fearless. Dhiraha. And is clear about attachment and detachment. He is clearly able to distinguish the two states and avoid attachment to unreal things. Bondage and liberation are understood. So, that is Sattvika intellect characterization in 1830. It is described. Similarly, 31 and 32 describes the uh, Rajasik and the Tamasika. So in summary, you can see characterization of intellect as uh, Sattvika is uh, defined by clarity of thinking. Rajasika is uh, defined by impulsive, indecisive and egoistic thinking. And Tamasika is defined by perverted, confused and sensual thinking. In summary, Fortitude, mind's character, strength. Mind strength is, Sattvika is defined by pers the ability for persistence, consistency and focus. Sattvik, Sattvik fortitude. Rajasika fortitude is defined by selfishness, impatience and excitement. Selfishness, impatience and excitement. Tamasika by distractions, lethargic nature and inactiveness. So focus of mind, Sattvika focus of mind by hand to uh, uh, at hand, uh, you know, for tasks in hand, persistence, follow through and initiatives are hallmarks, does not waver even in times of hardships, provide staying power and stamina to reach the goals, helps resolve and overcome obstacles and adverse situations and uh, is not distracted and, and, and never be, uh, get, will be getting dejected. So if you look at the verse 33, the characteristics of a Sattvika fortitude is defined and we need to cultivate those things. That's basically what we should look at. We should look at reducing 34 and completely shunning away what is described in 35, the Rajasika and Tamasika fortitudes. Then in verse number 36 and 37, uh, Krishna actually defines the Sattvika joy, the happinesses. What are Sattvika happiness is defined. Examples of Sattvika joy include doing something well and complete it to its logical end, taking ownership of actions and accomplishing it by your own efforts, creating a piece of work that is a masterpiece, creating uh, creative and innovative actions, uh, finding solutions to problems, understanding a subtle subject, Mastering a skill, sharing a smile, watching nature's beauty, nature in general, good health, breathing fresh air, and being fully aware of the joys of the self in all actions. That is joys of the self. Threefold pleasures are described and the joy sattvika pleasure is defined like this. Rajasika joy is pleasures of the senses that appear as nectar in the beginning and become poison in the end. Such are rajasika. Results from sensual pleasures, which are derived from gross objects of the senses. The joy of happiness that one derives from going after tasty food, late night partying, shopping binges, etc. You will feel happy, but later you will regret. So it is Rajasika. Tamasika, pressure that confuses a person in the beginning and in the end. Pressure from sleep, laziness and carelessness is Tamasika. Joy derived from drinking alcohol-based products. Joy derived from rape, murder and molestations. Joy derived from looting and plundering are all tamasic. Tamasic happiness. So we have 
the uh, different layers self, then the dotted line, the self in innermost, then the dotted line is the ego, then comes the self, the intellect, the mind, and the body. Egocentric self-satisfaction, fleeting happiness and accomplishment, intellectual satisfaction, arrogance and conceit, emotional satisfaction, greed, envy and jealousy, and physical satisfaction, lust and overindulgences. So this is how, you know, deriving the joys of the body, mind and intellect. But deriving the joys of the self is all about this self-satisfaction, inner, going inner, in, in, to the innards of our self, the mind. Self-satisfaction, bliss, fulfillment and beautitude, lasting happiness results. Joy for the self is driving you. To be motivated by and focused by the joys of the self in all our undertakings is called as devotion. So that is devotion. From this state, egocentric state, to this state where the ego is sublimated is basically what is required. And this is the, the way that divine people, divine natured people work. There is nothing animate or inanimate on earth or among the devas who can remain free from these three modes of nature. Okay, whatever it is, these Sattva Rajasthama Gunas are there. We have to get over it. It will be there. You cannot wish it away. Because that is the nature of material nature. Animate or inanimate. Everything is under the influence of rhythm, motion and inertia. If you look at the universe, in the Samashti Pravanjam, you will see this Sattva Rajasthama Gunas working as rhythm, motion and inertia. Harmonious motion, non-harmonic motion and inertia. And they, when within our minds, it works as knowledge, projection and ignorance. Sattva Rajasthama Tamas, again, same thing. So from the universe, you see the, this reflected as exactly the same thing is reflected in our mind. All of us think and act in this world. As a resultant of these gunas, three subterrages, tamo gunas, it is our now job to fine tune that. And for that only chapter 14 and chapter 16, 14 and chapter 16 were actually added. Gunatraya Vibhaga Yoga and the 16th. Devasura Sambhat Vibhaga Yoga, Vibhaga Yoga, differentiating these things. So that we can fine-tune Sattva Rajas and Tamos and elevate our Sattvic tendencies and become more and more Sattvic. Either when you are engaging in mere existential actions, referred to in the stanzas as earthly work, it's existential, to exist in this world, you need to do certain things, otherwise you will die. Or when we are engaged in creative and productive work, elevating work, referred to as among the devas, we are always shaped and aided by these three gunas. So, no one, no one can escape these gunas. Earthly work, existential action, creative, productive work, divine action. Within, so This is what all of us are engaged in. Sometimes we just existential action only. We get actually captured by that and we get tied up by that. We need to first get out of that and become creative and productive. Divine actions. Tap that. That is how you actually, you know, do this gratitude to Pradra, Nra, Buddha, Deva, Brahma, Yajas. But all have the capabilities. That is what now Krishna is going to engage and uh, to tell us. Arjuna was initially, you know, told that no one can escape the gunas. So what? So that means we are doomed. No, we are not doomed. Krishna says, all have the capability to shape the gunas. And that is what the essence of the purpose, essential purpose of Bhagavad Gita. Having supreme motivations is one way. Chapter 2. Developing the right set of attitudes, Jatnya, Tyaga, Samarpana, Prasada, Bhavas. Chapter 3. 
shaping the aptitudes brahmanatvam kshatriyatvam vaishyatvam shudratvam chapter 4 and integrating these attitudes aptitudes uh, shaping the aptitudes and attitudes and balancing the mind through shunning likes and dislikes karma sanyasa chapter 5 Minding the mind and uplifting the self by the self. Through Dhyana Yoga, chapter 6. Understanding the power of self as universal. Chapter 7, 8, 9, 10 and 11. Universal, sustainable, imperishable, infinite. And seeing everything everywhere, the glories, Vibhuti. And thus developing a grand vision. That is 7, 8, 9, 10 and 11 chapters. And in 12th, Characteristics of devotion, inspiration of the mind, chapter 12. Differentiating the gunas, nature, through chapter 14, chapter 16, chapter 17, and even chapter 18. The differentiation of the gunas, of the rajas, tamo gunas. We have still been still seeing that in 18th chapter also. Classifying the characteristics of these gunas, chapter 14, 16, 17, and 18 are doing that. In between chapter 15, which summarizes the essence of Bhagavad Gita, have all been described in great detail so far, so that it becomes clear to us to achieve a sattvic character. That is what we have been doing in the last 650 verses or so. And now another 50 more, 30, 40 more are there, 700 to reach 700. So at this point, let us look at, stop and think of the 10 paradigm ships that. To seek happiness within. What are we required to do? We, if we are not doing it so far, then try to change our life and thinking. How? One, avoid pleasures of the BMI. Instant glories, pleasures, etc. To be avoided. Seek the joys of the self in all our thoughts and actions. Constantly practice this. Keep doing that consistently and persistently in life by engaging in rightful duties. Never shun duties. Keep working. Do things. Be active. Actively engage in the resistance to evil. Produce more than you consume. And follow the processes for doing that. Do not be regretful of the past, nor be anxious of the future, or be agitated when you are doing things. But focus Right now, mindfulness to be applied. Get rid of selfish desire and anger because they are the gateways to hell. Mind the mind constantly. Minding the mind. Mindfulness. Mind the mind. So that's what, you know, keep looking at this, you know. If when you are doing, anger is coming, it is within the mind, not the self. Self is not only the and live in it. it is not the agent. The mind is the agent. The intellect is the agent. The senses are the agents. Aware of the omnipresence of the self. Be details oriented. Don't live a superficial life. Look at it. Analyze it. Go into depth. That is what the six, last six chapters teach us. But at the same time, do not lose track of higher goals. You should not be lost for the trees. You should see the forest as well. Be intrinsically passionate of deriving the joys of the self. Intrinsically passionate, that is devotion, for the joys of the self. Direct yourself to the self. Your lust, greed, anger, etc. Direct it towards the self. We have seen that in chapter 16, 17, etc. 16. Less luggage, more comfort. Sealing on desires. Less luggage, more comfort. Okay? Desires, selfish desires, check it out. And think big. So these are 10 paradigm shifts to seek happiness from within. From stanza 41 onwards, the message of the Gita is summed up with respect to alleviating the fear that it is difficult to break free from the clutches of the gunas. Do not be afraid. We need to get out. We can get out of it, Krishna says. So we will look at it that the only thing is we need to wait for another 23 hours to hear that. Tomorrow we will take up those part, that final part of the Bhagavad Gita from chapter 40, one onward. We will look at it tomorrow. That we will discuss tomorrow. And so at this point, I will stop here for the, uh, and then I will continue uh, tomorrow with the final uh, 
thirty verses or so, thirty five verses or so, and a wrap up to the Bhagavad Gita essence, Gita intelligence effect. So till that time. Shut the